Well, this is a day that I have been anticipating for a while. I have been following Feather on social media for a few months now, and and every single post, I'm like, oh my gosh, I love this woman. I love her (laughs) posts. I love how she cares about children. I love the information. It's just so ripe with education and prevention and this compassion and love for children. So Mr. Rogers, which I love, and and I was just like, I must, I must um, Zoom interview this lady and, and turn as many people on as possible to the work that you're doing. And I thought, I'm just going to ask her if she'll do it. And you said yes. So thank you so much, Feather, for for being here. And I just want to dive right in with um, pretending that nobody knows about you and just who you are and how long you've been doing this and whatever you want to share with our audience. I am anxious to share you with my people. Thank you, Catherine, so much. I'm touched and likewise right back at you for the work you're doing for children around sex abuse prevention and exploitation and all we're in this together so we're in this together we are so let's see that's a broad question let's start with <laughs> i i i started in this field of child sex abuse prevention a long time ago in the early 80s and the brief story is this i get asked often how i got into this work i was studying at san francisco state university for my undergrad uh, ba degree and I, we had to do an internship to graduate, and I had no idea what I wanted to do with a women's studies degree. All I knew is that I wanted to work with children in some way. And through that requirement, I came across a program called uh, Child Sex Abuse, Pre- uh, CAP, Child Abuse Prevention Project. You may have heard of it in Maine. And I came across it kind of... Uh, haphazardly, really. I was at home one evening with my roommate and we turned the TV on and a movie came across the television, a made-for-TV movie called Something About Amelia. And I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's an old movie with Ted Dansk in it, but it's, I think it's 90 minutes or two hours. It's about a 13-year-old girl who's being incested by her father. And I was probably 22 or three years old and the movie was there. We watched it together and I was riveted. I had no experience with, quite honestly, with incest or sex abuse. I'm sure I had friends and loved ones who were survivors, but I did not know that. And I didn't have any experience with this area. But I I was so moved and riveted for some reason, my heart was just pulled. And at the end of the movie, I turned to my roommate and I said, that's my life work. And with the requirement of needing to do an internship, I began to look for programs that were working with sexually abused children. And what I came upon was a prevention program, not a treatment program, but prevention, which heightened my interest. And they took me on and I worked for CAP through that internship. And then they hired me when I graduated and I worked with CAP for five years. And briefly, CAP was is a program which got me started and my heart will always be with CAP. Um, a program for children in preschool through high school that teaches children how to keep themselves safe from sexual abuse. It educates them about bullies, strangers, and known people who might touch them. And I did that work for many years, Got my went back to school and got my master's degree in social work, and then moved to Colorado. And over the years of doing this work, it became really clear to me that Though it's important to give children skills and information, protection skills to to help keep themselves safe, really the responsibility for child sex abuse prevention is on adults, that children can learn these protection skills. It's important that they do, but ultimately it is up to adults to protect kids, not for children to have to protect themselves. And there I was in the classrooms day after day after day, which I will never regret, give teaching children, say no, tell, run, never keep secrets, all of these good concepts. However, Catherine, I have come to learn that for me, at least personally, 
that it is so important to understand the reality of the crime, which is that most children, and you know this, don't say no when it, this is happening to them. Most children don't run. Where are they to run to when it's their own bed in the middle of the night? They don't scream out. It's their family. It's a friend. It's someone close. They don't tell. They do keep secrets. So all of this information we were teaching to kids, still important today, and we can get into that. But I felt this move that I needed to make to educate the adults to be communicating these concepts with their caregivers and the other adults and teenagers who are around their child to create a deterrent for anyone who might offend instead of putting the burden on children. Now, I'm not saying that a child shouldn't learn that secrets might not be safe, but I through my work and through my evolution in this work, I've, I've, I've developed nuances in the language that I think are more healthy for children and, and will take the blame off of them and the shame off of them. If, For instance, I know I'm babbling here. So no, you know, no, you're not, you know, you're not, you're not babbling. And I was just going to ask you and you, and you did it instinctively. So give me an example of that. Okay. For instance. Okay. So, so my whole mission in Parenting Save Children, the, the business that I have, is to educate adults to keep children safe from sexual abuse. Instead of educating children to keep themselves safe, we're educating everyone around the child. So their family, their caregivers, their youth organizations, et cetera. So the typical prevention model and, and language in our country and elsewhere is to teach children to say no to run, to yell, and to tell, and never keep secrets if someone attempts to touch their genitals or ask them to touch someone else's. And all of that's great. We can still teach that. But if we're pounding into a child's head, and I just saw a post like this the other day, teach your children that if anyone touches their private parts, they must say no. Okay. Imagine teaching that to a seven-year-old. You must say no. Nothing's ever happened to them. And then they experience sexual abuse, unfortunately. They've learned you must say no. They don't say no because they don't, typically. The brain freezes. The body freezes. There's a trauma. It's someone they love. They don't say no. Adults and, did. and then they didn't follow mommy's rules, and then the shame's increased. So this is an example. So my shift in that is just instead of teaching a child, you must say no, or you should always say no, or you should always run or come tell me right away, is just take the language and say, if anyone tries to touch your genitals or gives you an unsafe touch or asks you to touch theirs, you have my permission. You have the right to. You are allowed to say no and do whatever you can to get away. I will listen. I will believe you. I will. And if you can't, I understand. It's hard. Instead of run right now, that's not the reality. And I don't think many people are thinking about looking at that's the. A, that's a beautiful shift. I, I love that feather. That's a beautiful. So I, as a survivor, uh, with tremendous lots of lived experience, I'm just imagining that from my child self hearing that. And how how loving and kind is that language? And I also felt a feeling of expansion, like, okay, you know, it's not a constricted, it's like, okay, I can tell. I, I love that. I think that's a, a wonderful uh sage from lots of years of experience, wisdom in that in that carburetor yeah. shift. Yeah. So that's that's my focus, really. And I do workshops for parents. I'm now through Zoom. It used to be in person in Colorado. And I so people are coming from all over the world in different countries with the same issues everywhere. You know, the same dynamics of sex abuse, whether it's in Africa or Colorado, where I live, it, it, all over, the same dynamics happen. So I do the workshops for parents. And I also I'm training schools and youth organizations in child sex abuse prevention policies, how to implement them, the importance of them, and not just to have them written on paper in a handbook, in a drawer, but really training the entire staff. I just did one Friday, how to follow behavioral expectations in a youth organization, which deters, hopefully, offense. We can never promise that. 
but I've done quite a bit of work uh, in with men and some women who have sexually offended. And it's a part of my work that for I don't know what the reason is that I'm capable of holding. And I am fascinated with it. And I don't expect everyone to be able to do that. But I'm not a survivor. And so I'm called to this from a different place. I mean, I think all women in general have had some kind of violation that we experience. But in terms of childhood sex abuse, I did not live that. I had other traumas, but not that. And I'm I'm able to sit with men who do this to children and learn from them and learn what it is that they need in us to get access to a child, what they're looking for in families, what they're looking for in children, and then to take synthesize all of that information and be able to share with parents, this is, this is what you can do to keep your child safe, as scary as it is. And there's, as you probably know in this work, there are so many boundaries around, I didn't mean boundaries, I meant barriers in teaching prevention and getting people to want to learn this. It's not easy to get people to want to sit through a workshop to learn about prevention. It, it just isn't. But once they do, yeah. It's one of the, one of the deteriorate. Oh, I'm hearing a feedback. Okay, there's gone. Um, one of the things that I hear, well, first of all, um, I love everything that you're saying and we're on the same page. You know, I think that, you know, access is the, is the big deal, right? So we know that in order for a, sec, a successful um, abuse of a child, you need to have a male or female that has the inclination to abuse. Um, they need a vulnerable child and what child isn't. And they need access. And we don't have a lot of control about the first two, but we have all the control on the third. And yes. being able to have policies and procedures in place for any place there are children under that roof. And as you say, not in a in a drawer, but a working, a, a living policy and procedure that keeps a child safe. Um, you know, the Boy Scouts did that with, if you're going to text, you have to text two people. There's no one-on-one -on -one time. Yep. Um, a lot of the faith-based organizations, Methodist Church, for instance, um, all of their um, their Sunday school has to have a door open or a window yep. totally unblocked. There's all these different things yep. that, that are possible, but preventing that access. And, um, and I, I applaud the work that you're doing with offenders, male and female offenders, because um, that's where we learn, you know, and, and, and we have learned, I've only been doing this since 2015. Um, it, it is, they have, you know, they're, you know, I was going to say the word hunter, but I mean, they are looking for the most vulnerable and, and although lower income, busier, um, single parent, you know, there's all kinds of um, indicators. And I don't focus so much on that because I don't want people to feel safe if they're not in that mm -hmm. because they're not, you know, it happens I'm, to any child <laughs> happens to happens to any child. So I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, can you tell me more about the work that you, that you do with, with people online? So how would, well, one of the barriers you were talking about, there are barriers to people. And I think one of them, at least what I hear here in Maine is um, not my child. Yep. And I, don't know, I don't know where this is happening, but my child is so smart. And I, the governor had a, had a, um, the governor's summit on trafficking. And I was getting ready for a, for a bodybuilding competition at the time. So I, everybody was having breakfast and I was hitting the gym and a beautiful resort upstate Maine. And the, the uh, guy in charge, the manager said, what are you guys here? And I said, well, we're here about um, sex trafficking, but my, I primarily do child sexual abuse prevention. And he said, well, my 12 year old girl and I are this close, like we're peas and carrots. Nobody could ever successfully abuse my daughter, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I said, um, 
and I probably shouldn't have, but I said, um, so you guys are really close. Yeah, we're really close. She loves you more than anything. Oh my gosh, she loves me more than anything. So I said, okay, well, there's a huge hill. Um, this The resort is on the top. So somebody tells her that they're going to cut the brakes on your truck so that you have an accident and die if um, if he doesn't have, uh, if she doesn't give him oral sex. Do you think that your daughter is going to save your life? And he was just like, you know, and I said, I'm sorry to put it that way, but offenders are, are incredible manipulators and they will use the love that she has for you against, um, against the you in, in order uh, to get a successful abuse. That's just what they do, you know, and it's sort of like sales. They've got all these different ones in the hopper. And one might take a year to groom, and one might take six months to groom, and one they're abusing now. And this is sort of what they what they do. So I get my child would, you know, my child is different, you know, and I tell my child, if it doesn't feel good, and I say, well, what if it does? Nobody talks to the child about well, what if it does feel good, you right. know? So it is happening. They will use love and whatever they think will work against them. They need access to get to get at the, the child. That's where you need to step in. And it is as bad as they say it is. And it would be so cool for somebody else to say that. <laughs> you know, you know that, that this is a problem. And you know about Homeland Security doing you know, every four years, they do a national research. And uh, in October, they came out and said that sexual online exploitation is the number one um, uh, issue that we have. And yeah. if Homeland Security is saying it, maybe yeah. they're saying it will do something. <laughs> I start every workshop with with asking people, why don't we focus on child sex abuse prevention the way we do on bike safety, water safety, car safety, which every parent typically does? And right. the answers that I get are what you just said is the denial, not my child. And that's what every person I've spoken with who abuses children tell me that's what they need is that's their best friend is denial. The discomfort is the biggest one, really, Catherine is that it's so uncomfortable for people to think about this. And, and offenders are looking for our discomfort and children are looking for us to push through it. And so the barriers are there. It usually takes like three or four invitations for someone to actually come to one of my workshops or to read a book or to learn. Yeah. But once they do... There's this transformation that is incredible to watch because the workshop, at least that I present, it is not filled with fear tactics. It is not filled with gory stories whatsoever. I do give the facts the, very quickly, the prevalence. I talk about grooming and how it happens through the process of grooming the, the adults first mm. and really also focus on, I mean, we keep talking about how in, a, in, in our conversation, how a person you know, picks the most vulnerable child and needs opportunity and access. Well, when it's incest, the access is inherent. It's right, right there. Right. And most people don't know that sibling sexual abuse and incest is the most common type of incest that occurs. Child to child sex abuse is out of control. It's rampant. And that's not, people are thinking about this dirty old man hanging out here who's going to get their child. And, and those myths keep children vulnerable, not safe. And so the way what I do in, in the workshop is present some of the facts there, the grooming, how to speak up if you see grooming, because it's not enough to just understand grooming, like with those policies in schools. That's great. The one-on-one, -on -one, the, the windows, the no texting students, the, all of that is what I'm teaching, but it has to be practiced. Right. right? It has people, we can't prevent child sex abuse unless we know what grooming is, unless we are able to recognize it, one, but most importantly, speak up if we see it. And the rest of my workshop is practicing that. We practice conversations to have with nannies and babysitters and play date parents, sleepover parents, before you choose to have your child go on that play date. I so call that, it that, that's the thing that I have been asked for so many times. Um, they asked me for a script, you know, I'll give it to you. <laughs> right. So that, that is, I'm so glad that a part of your workshop 
has that practice. It is, it is so important. I'm it's a, yeah, it's about 90 minutes of the workshop is I love that. It's part two. And the practice is this. So for, this is what happens. Part one is the information. How does this crime happen to children? How does grooming happen? And how do you speak up? And age appropriate sexual behavior in children versus concerning behavior. What are the differences? Because parents need to know that. So that's part one. Part two are the body safety rules for children and the and the boundaries. No one's allowed to touch your genitals, privacy, secrets, all of the information for children. But then the most important part in my passion is helping caregivers take those body safety rules that you are teaching your children and tell them, communicate them to the school and the babysitters and the play dates and and the camp counselor and gymnastics. And that's what I call a prevention team, building this team. And so the last 90 minutes where I show some videos of a parent asking a school uh, uh, director what her CSA policies are, child sex abuse prevention policies are, and they're in this conversation through a video so parents can see what it looks like. And then we practice it. Beautiful. And then we practice the play day. I am inviting your child to come to my house to, to play for the afternoon. Catherine, how do you start the conversation with me around body safety? Before you decide, yes, this is a batch. This is part of my prevention team. I feel good about this. Instead of just dropping your kid off at one o'clock and picking them up at three, right? Questions to ask on a sleepover. We practice how to talk to your own family because we know that the majority of sex abuse happens within families. So how to deal with grandma's resistance to wanting her hug when she wants it and demanding that that your child's being rude when she doesn't give it. And like all of those dynamics that are real for people around these issues. So it's not a workshop of fear tactics. It's practical. And people leave feeling incredibly empowered and ready to implement this daily, not just, oh, a talk once a year. I love that. When I talk to law enforcement and child advocates, And we ask them, you know, okay, well, you've got children. Uh, What do you do for sleepovers? What do you do? And every single one of them said, sleepovers are at my house. My kid does not do sleepovers over somebody else's house. Okay, let me... Or Mm -hmm. no sleepovers at at all. Okay, no sleepovers are all is one thing. But what I would say to those law enforcement enforcement people is this. And there's, there's usually something that I weave in that's that I'm responding to where, okay, that's fine, and. So here's the deal. Just because the sleepover is at your house doesn't mean something unsafe won't happen. Right. Right? So the sleepover is at your house. What I'm trying to help parents do is build a prevention team with adults. And if you have not had a conversation with that other parent about their boundaries and what their child's learn, and you haven't connected and gotten on the same page about agreeing uh, about the children's behavior, for instance, like screen time or or bedtime or the food they eat or the allergies they have and the medicine they need to take, but around sex abuse, around doors open and around touching rules. If you haven't done that, I don't care whose house it's at because that other child can come over to your house. I would say this to the police officer. And that child can bring a device and they're in the room playing and they're looking at porn. So these, yeah, I mean, the conversation with other adults is really the most important part here than focusing on the children. This is so cool. I, I love that you're offering exactly what I'm hearing there's a need for. And, you know, that's what I look for. I look for, okay, what is the need of my community? Um, What is it that they need? Who is teaching that? Who's an expert in that area? And then how do I build a bridge between Feather and the, and the people that are saying, Hey, I want a script because I don't know what to do. Yeah. Well, I would love to work with your community. I just just thought of something about the officer because Sometimes when I hear these situations that get me going, it's like if the other kid is, if someone says only at my house, they're assuming that their house is safe. Yeah. And hopefully it is. But yeah. what if, what if that officer's brother comes over? So right. the uncle, 
And he, unbeknownst to him, his brother has a sexual behavior problem with children. Right. So it's just a false safety. Can you know, I, I can yeah. I give you a scenario? I would love yeah. to hear this just um like as long as it's not like consultation where I can get into legal no issue. okay no, it's not legal. So a years many years ago, a uh, an older I thought she was older then I'm now as old. <laughs> oh, 60. So 60. Yes. A 60 year old um woman and her and her two sisters and brother you know, siblings are all visiting their mother and the, uh, the brother had remarried and there is a 14 year old stepdaughter. So the mom and the three daughters are in the house preparing the meal and the brother and his 14 year old stepdaughter are outside on the swing in the backyard. And one of the siblings says, did you know, I'll just call, his, I'm going to call his name, John, John, don't be mad at me. So John, um, John's swinging and the, and the sister said, did you know that John took Mary, the stepdaughter, um, camping, just the two of them for a weekend? Is, do you guys think that's weird or what do you, you know? And so they were just sort of talking about it amongst themselves, acknowledging that the relationship seemed weird. But nobody did or said anything. And then two years later, the stepdaughter um, um, confides in someone, and and now John goes to jail for for child right. sexual abuse. Ugh. So I have used her analogy many times with the two different ways it you know it could have gone down, and like what what they should have done. I would love to hear from you. Yep. How you think that should have been played out? I love to talk about this. So we cannot un underestimate intuition right. and gut feelings. When something, when we get like something's off, something's weird, it usually is. Yeah. I'm not saying we have to go to the police every time we get some kind of feeling. But when things are safe, Catherine, when nothing untoward is going on, we don't get that feeling. Right. Right. There's so much out there around intuition. One of my favorite authors, you probably I don't know if you've heard of his work, is um, I don't have it here. I have it back there, is Gavin De Becker, Protecting the Gift. Highly recommend. Yeah. 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 So what I would say in that situation is it sounds like some of the siblings, the, the siblings who were adults, had a weird feeling, mm -hmm. right? So what I rep and we practice this in a role play in my workshop. Love that. Yep, we do, is you notice something that makes you uncomfortable. And the example I typically give is you notice someone is tickling a child underneath their T-shirt, on their belly, at nap time in a school, okay? The policies say no tickling. So the language that I offer is something like, I notice, well, this might feel really uncomfortable, Catherine, because it's hard to talk about this, but I know we both care about the children, so I'm going to bring this up with you. I notice, and I'm making it personal here, like, like it's in a role play. Yeah, I notice yeah. that you're taking Mary um, camping on the weekends and she looks a little uncomfortable about that. Or I notice you're tickling Susie under her shirt, or I notice you're taking Billy into the, into the uh, bedroom with the door shut, whatever it is you notice. That's what I would have recommended to those sisters is to say something. I noticed this. Well, I, I bet if you ask them, I mean, I don't have the details here, but there were more than just the camping. There was probably many behaviors before the camping mm -hmm. that they noticed that was odd. Because going camping in and of itself might not be odd, but there was something else that was happening for them. Mm -hmm. And when we turn away and we are quiet, we are giving on some level, permission for that person. I'm not blaming us. Right. Right. But we are allowing it to continue. When we speak up, this is what I learned from sitting with men and women who abuse, is they are looking closely at our behavior. They're looking more at ours than the child. They're looking to see, are we uncomfortable? And if we are, do we turn away or do we say something? And here's the thing, back to prevention with kids, and I spent 15 years teaching kids to say no. How do we expect a child 
to say, no, I don't want to do that or stop touching me when we see behaviors that are unsafe and we do not say anything. We can't teach a child to talk about sex abuse if we won't talk about it. Right. Right. So in that situation, I would have recommended that they say something or that they, because the child's old enough at 14 to talk to the kid. Mm -hmm. Are you safe? How do you feel about going camping? Is there something going on you want to talk to me about? I'm uncomfortable with behaviors I see. Like, name it. Put it out there instead of shroud it with the secrecy. I I love that. And I'm so relieved because unlike you, I I don't have um, a degree or a master's. It was just my gut feeling that was like, you know, hindsight is always 20-20, but being able to say something to the brother, like, hey, you know, we see this. And I I love the way you did it so much more professionally. But I was like, hey, we're, you know, we're seeing you doing this. And it just, there's a red flag for us. And we wanted to talk to you about it. Um, and then also talk to the girl and say, yeah. hey, we, you know, we love you being a part of this family and telling us the truth about something that might be uncomfortable isn't going to dissolve the love that we have for you or your place in our family. Right. And we're noticing, you know, we're seeing this and it's making us feel uncomfortable. So we just want to let you know that we love you. It's safe here. And if you're uncomfortable, we, this is a safe time to tell us. Perfect. And and here's the thing. If the person, the man, the the stepfather was not grooming and not offending, There's a whole array, and we practice this role play in the workshop. There's a whole array of of responses he might have. He might get really embarrassed. He might feel shameful. He might get defensive. He might get angry. He might say, thank you for pointing it out. I I meant nothing, et cetera. And it stops. The behavior stops. If he is grooming and he is offending, now he knows people are watching and makes it much more difficult. And the concept here, and I cannot promise this, but the concept is when we speak that way directly, it deters the person. You and I both know from just listening to you, Catherine, today, that people who sexually abuse children are very frightened of being found out. Right. Even though, even though somewhere in them, I have learned they want to be caught. They do because they don't want to be doing what they're doing, but many of them. but. They're looking for the most, they're very small inside. They're scared. They're not like these giants that we see them as. Right. You know? right. And the minute they smell us noticing and educated and aware, they they disappear. There's two things I wanted to ask. One of them was, um, so someone was saying, you know, how does an offender choose? And I And I go back and forth between the word predator and offender. Some people are in the camp of one or the the other. I sort of go back and forth. Um, but so how do they how do they choose? And and I give I give an example, and the example is a bunch of 12, 13-year-old girls at the mall. Their, you know, their mothers drop them off to have have their their Friday night in the mall. And the girls are all dressed up and they're in their little pack and they're checking things out at the mall and getting food at the food court. And uh, in this case, the offender is a, is a, is a man. Um, he's been watching them, you know, for a while. And he goes into that group. And side note, it is almost always somebody that they uh, know and trust. But in this case, I'm using a stranger analogy. Yep. Um, the stranger bumps into one of the girls to to feel her out. And, and how he does that is he bumps into her and um, and he looks down at her and says, you have beautiful, whatever her eye color is, you've got beautiful green eyes. And if she says, no, I don't, and goes away, there you go, there's a vulnerable girl. Um, if she says, yeah, I do, I got them from my dad, that person is, she's confident. And so there's easy tests to find out who has got the lower self-esteem, who is more vulnerable, even in just girls walking around in the mall. Yeah. And like you said, that is a stranger example. I mean, you're showing the the body language they look for. And most of what you just described happens with someone very close. Yeah. Here's yeah, it, another, I'll give you another example that'll make it. Yeah. Side by side. With, better. Yeah. 
And then I want to um, also mention my feelings about predator and offender. And then I'm just looking at the I think we're good. Um, so there's a birthday party and there's a bunch of five-year-old children. And there's a teenage cousin that's at the birthday party with all the adults. And the teenage cousin says, it's really hot out. Let's have, let's play a game. Let's all get naked and run around the sprinkler and, and run in, inside the water. And whoever has the cutest birthday suit will get the, the prize. Let's get in our birthday suits and run through the sprinkler and the winner will get the special prize. Okay. All the kids take off their clothes and get in their birthday suit because they want the, the prize. And one child says, I'm not allowed to take my clothes off at other people's houses. I don't get naked. I'm not doing that. No one's allowed to see my private parts because the child's been educated. And this is where I'm not saying it's the burdens on the child, but this right. is where right. skills come in for children. Right. Which kid is that guy going to stay away from? Right. Right. So there is importance in educating children. There's there's so there's so much um, to this. Um, it's easy when y- you look for it. And of, of course, it's uncomfortable, you know, uh, being having the conversation, signing up for a class, which I, I think you should do as a as a family, like I think at your partners. Um, I, I love the idea when we do Tony Robbins virtual events, we all get together and make it, you know, make it fun and learn. Everybody learn yeah. together. I love that. So they uh, the uncomfortableness. And then the practicing, you know, the, the truth is it is skill and yeah. skills can be learned. And, you know, just like CPR, like you said, just like stop, drop and roll, just like whatever the thing is, is a skill. And when we practice a skill, it gets easier over time. And when you learn to, you were talking about um, how do we expect a child to say something in the moment when we don't speak up about a boundary you know, it's, we're uncomfortable, you know, we having an intuition about something or we have a boundary about something. We can't do that. How we expect this little child to, you know, to do something. Well, that uncomfortableness to do that gets less over time in practice. Yeah. And you offer your participants the gift of being able to practice. Right. I remember my first time somebody, um, said a rape joke that I, I was within hearing shot of this older man with three employees at a, at a home goods store. And I had pulled up next to the sidewalk. So my husband could like put the thing in the back of the truck. I couldn't help, but hear this joke about rape. And I, and I, me, I did not want to get out of the truck and confront this guy. And I I had a I had a legit fight with myself. And then I just said, you know, I was working with girls in incarcerated. And I'm like, what, you know, how could I face the girls in the group? Like I need to, I need to be an example. So I got out and had to, you know, and chose to walk over and say, hey, I am a survivor of rape and I am really off put by what you just said. And and I saw wedding rings and you gentlemen, you know, are, are married. How would you feel if this was your wife or mom or sister that he's talking about? And it takes a village for us to say that that's not funny. Good for you. Okay. And it was, you know, and then the guy made a joke and and said, this is why I don't tell that kind of joke in mixed company. Oh. And I said, and I said, mixed company or not, like, it's not a funny joke. Right. And, uh, and it ended with, to my delight because I'm sure it doesn't always end this way. Um, the man took a breath and and said, you're right. I shouldn't be making fun of this. I promise to take this jo- this one joke out of my repertoire. Wow. <laughs> and then, right? And then I, I did the Scooby snack. Really? Oh my gosh, you're wonderful. You know, um, yeah. so he could feel, you know, yeah, a positive. So. so he would feel a positive association with making that choice. Right. You know? So, um, it, it, it takes, uh, t- and I, I'd never had that practice before. So what a gift feather that you offer that to the people who participate. So who, who would be an ideal, um, uh, participant for your workshops? Do you have different kinds of workshops? What, what, it, what is your offering in, in the world? Yeah. Of so I have parent workshop, 
and a youth professional. The youth professional schools, camps, organizations hire me. So that's available for the policies. And then for parents, which is most of the workshops that I do, anyone and everyone, so a parent, a foster parent, step parent, caregiver, aunts, uncles, people who are know they will have children in the future but don't have them yet, parents bring their nannies and babysitters, pediatricians, anyone with a child in their life in any way or who cares about children. So the, my audience, most of the time, people who are registering are parents of children, I'd say zero to 10 years old. I mean, you can certainly come with teenagers because it's just as applicable having a conversation with a parent on a sleepover around alcohol and driving and, you know, other issues yeah. versus um, when they're five years old. So really anyone. And I get hired by schools and organizations. And I have my next workshop in March is um, I was hired by two sisters who just want to give this to their community. And so yeah. that one is they're done in two consecutive weekends. So the next one is March 23rd and 30th from 10 until 1230 Eastern time. So they're two and a half hours, two weeks in a row. Materials are included, a 12 page packet of materials, and it's really powerful. And so my website, parentingsafechildren.com and then slash calendar has all my dates and people can just sign up. And I mean, they're all public. Anyone can so I, I, I love that that uh, those sisters are doing it for the community, and we'll um, end here in just a minute. And offline, we'll talk about that because I would I would love to be able to offer that to my community as well. Right, we'll do that. Can I say one last thing about offenders and and predators, real yeah. quick? Okay, so I I don't ever use the word predator actually, and the reason is I want to do my best to help people get the myth out of their brain. And the myth is when we think of predator, even though the behavior is predatory, right? But we think of predator, he's a predator, she, she's a predator. We think of the myth, the person jumping out of the bushes, the person who's not part of our family, and that doesn't serve children. Right. Okay. The, that's just for me. It's just a sensational word. Yeah. Um, offender. I, and this is just personal for me, is that I don't like labels in general, Catherine. I like to, I prefer to say a person who sexually abuses because I have sat with enough men where I have learned, and I'm not excusing their behavior whatsoever, but I have learned the circumstances in their life and the abuse sometimes that they have suffered psychologically, sexually, that brings them to that point. I'm not excusing it whatsoever. Do you, do you think? Do you think that it was so? Out of a hundred offenders, um, people that abuse, that sexually abuse, um, do you think that half of them it's a uh, they're doing to others what was done to them, and half are true um, biological pedophiles? Yeah. So I, I mean, I'm not. I have not done a research study, so I'm just talking on my experience. Most of the men that I've spoke with have not been sexually abused. Okay. Some have definitely, but many, many haven't. And yeah. so as far as the label, there is more to a person than I, he is an offender. There's just a whole life. So that's yeah. just, so I don't use either word. I, I, I like that. So um, Dr. David Finkelhor, are you familiar with him? Oh yeah, I've been. Um, I'm on one of his committees, and I've spoken um, um, on a panel with him. He's an amazing human being. Yeah. I, I've actually only gotten starstruck twice in my life, and one was uh, Victor Veith, who um, worked for the nation's capital as um, um, a lawyer, uh, crimes against children. And now is in charge of the Zero Abuse Project. If you're familiar with that, I looked at it on your website. Yeah, and then Dr. David Finkelhor. Finkelhor. Just, I was just like, ah, you know, yeah. just well, uh, you could ask him this question, and what he would oh, tell oh, you. Yeah. yeah, what he would tell you, and what I've learned, and this is a whole nother topic we won't get into today. But most people who sexually abuse children, most adults who sexually abuse children, are not pedophiles. Most are not. So they um, they were saying that um, that the 
age to identify that in children is between, it's mostly boys at the 12 to 14 yes. year old. Um, and that um, I was hoping to be able to incorporate um, that information into an Empower Me program with zero abuse, but I don't know if we're there yet. Being able to help the children who have those feelings I identify them and have a plan for themselves on how to not. Um, yeah. So that's, that's, I'm working on that. Thank you. And I can give you resources when we, hang, when we say goodbye. And yeah, on my website, thanks. on my resource page, I have resources for people who have sexual feelings for children and, and are attracted to children. That is different than the men that I have sat with who are situational abusers. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's the cool thing was if you have those feelings that there are um, a lot of people who don't act out. Absolutely. Which is so cool. And, and, and gold star to them. And we should be, you know, one, one last thing that just popped into my head was in the grocery store, I saw a guy with um, a sweatshirt, you know, um, save your community, save a child, kill a pedophile kind of thing. And I said, excuse me, sir, again, so difficult for me to um, do these things. But I went up to him and said, excuse me, sir, I appreciate where you're coming from. I I get it. I know you're trying to make a stand for what's good. But if you have children in your life and they see your shirt and they hear you talking about doing harm to somebody who offends children, (laughs) trying Mm -hmm. to use your language um, uh, incorporated as mine, um, uh, they're not going to feel safe to tell you because the person who's who's abusing them is probably somebody that they know and they don't want that person to be right. killed. Right. They just want the person to stop abusing them. Right. And Catherine, what if that man's 12-year-old son had sexual feelings for children? Right. We 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 separate like it can't yeah. be. Yep. Thank you. Oh, I love that you speak up like that. Well, it's um, not fun. It's, yeah. but, and you but you offer them, but you offer them practice. Oh yeah. my gosh! Come to oh. my workshops, March twenty third, thirtieth, and then April is Child Abuse Prevention Month, and I have three in April, so it's on my calendar. Um, and my book is available. Yeah. So uh, hold up your book. Do you have it right there? I do. Off Limits: A Parent's Guide to Keeping Children Safe from Sexual Abuse. Nice. So that's the book, and my conversation starter cards are a pack of cards that help, oh, do I have one? Here we go. That help parents start these uncomfortable conversations. So there's 25 cards in the pack. The front says four facts, four four body safety rules, four facts about child sex abuse, and four asks. And it's called, will you join our family's prevention team? So parents can hand this to the babysitter, to the teacher, to the gymnastics coach, to say, can we talk about body safety? If you're handing this to someone who sexually abuses children and you don't know that, I bring this to the treatment groups that I go to. They say they'd run the other way. Right. So there is an organization called Youth Strategies. um, And a part of my grant is going towards this organization to create a Jeopardy game. So you have your fax card. So they're creating, they, um, like, um, I don't know, I think Chicago, the questions and answers was really around gang related. So you, you change the question answers depending on what group you're doing. Um, I would love to bring you in on creating the questions and answers for the youth strategies. And that might be a really cool collaboration for you. Okay. We'll talk about Let's that. Talk my, about mind, it. my mind, my yeah. mind is spinning. Well, so, thank you so much. Is there for anything this. you wanted to end with? Um, just I have so much respect for you for you know your the violation you experienced as a child and how you're whoops, excuse me how you're bringing this to the world now to help other children, you know. And I guess what I would say to listeners is whatever it takes for you to muster the courage to learn about this, please do it. You know, I hear so often, Catherine, just the other day, I I don't I couldn't sit through a workshop like that. My anxiety would be too much. Mm-hmm. And I ask, I'll end with this. Are you willing to feel a little uncomfortable? 
learning about child sexual abuse prevention. So your children never have to experience it. Amen. Are you willing to be uncomfortable a little bit so kids don't have to? And that's a personal decision. And I know that it's triggering for survivors. But when you have a child, not but, and when you have a child, it's it's our responsibility to do whatever we can, you know, to make sure we're creating environments that minimize risk. Well, I don't know what happened to you in a previous life that would that would cause you to have the reaction you did when you saw that movie and set the trajectory of your life to this cause. Um, this is not uh, lucrative. This is not fun. This no. is not anybody's idea of a good time. This isn't a happy topic. You're not no. dealing with happy people. Um, the, all of it is as hard as anything can possibly get in this world. Yeah. And the fact that you've done this for 20 something years. 40. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm your same age. <laughs> okay. Really? You look yeah. fabulous. Oh. <laughs> it's the Zoom filter. <laughs> right. Yeah. I was like, how's my Zoom filter? Oh, you're doing well, great. Um, I, I just. I am so humbled and appreciative. I could not do this work until I did my own work. So I was, you know, nearly 50 before I was public about anything, you know, 20 yeah. years of going through it, 20 years of healing it. Um, and then um, 20 years of, of thriving and then going, I, I need to, I need to give back. And all that time that I was doing that, you were out in the trenches before it was cool. Before there was a Homeland Security thing, before there was the Center for Instagram, before, before there was Instagram, before there was anything, your wisdom that you've learned, like you said, I've I've developed nuances. You said uh, that is not fresh into this new hot topic. That is forty years of of ex, of sage wisdom and experience gained. I can't wait to just bring you. To, to my world and and share your wisdom. So thank you so much. I'm going to turn off the, okay. the record if I take care of yourselves, everyone, when you're listening to this and yeah, very, very important, right? The people who get triggered. Yeah. My favorite one is I put my foot on the ground and I say, I'm right here. It's right now. I'm right here for you. Yeah. And breathe.